everyone. Well, welcome to episode three of the Access of Who podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about ownership. Um, we're going to be delving deeper into questions on intellectual property, um, copyright, trademark, and everything that we have been discussing um, very briefly in the in the previous episodes. Um, how did we get here? We've been talking about digital technology. We've been talking about the potential that it has uh, for museums, for restitution, and really understanding what different practitioners are doing in the digital space. But at the same time, we are also very aware that the digital world is an entirely new and different universe um, that people are not really fully understanding of. But at the same time, people are learning and making their way as they go. Uh, we ended the last episode by asking practitioners what digital restitution means. And we had very different answers, but all pointing to the idea that ownership is central to the question of digital restitution in as much as it is central to the question of physical restitution. And so there's this issue of um, ownership. And when we talk about ownership, we're talking about the ownership of the objects and the original artifacts or archives or um, the things that we have um, physically, and then there's the ownership of their copies and their digital copies. So who owns the object? Who owns the digital copy? Who has the rights to make copies of the copies? Um, and this really is an, in, an intellectual property discussion that has um, very wide-ranging um, and deep impact um, on the restitution question. Uh, a disclaimer, Malemo and I are not legal experts, one day maybe, but this should not be considered legal advice. Uh, as we began, we said that we are exploring these questions and we hope that the insights that you gain from this episode um, can help you navigate uh, some situations. Yeah, today we're going hardcore. We're getting deep into the details of um, some of these really complex questions of particularly restitution and the digital question. And, and as you say, Chow, I think today's conversation, I'm really excited for it. It's a, a really complex negotiation of questions of the original and what it means to have property and ownership of an original, which, which is the kind of object artifact in the museum, but also then thinking about what it means to have the rights to a copy of that original, which is the digital version of that. Um, and, and how does that operate? And uh, we speak to some really amazing people to deal with that today. And to really also begin to touch on a vital question, which is often not discussed in uh, restitution conversations, but is this kind of elephant in the room around money, 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 and what restitution has, uh, what it offers to the African continent in terms of a kind of reparation for what's been lost over a long period of time, but also some of the motivation behind the resistance to restitution also being very much around the kinds of value derived from these objects that these museums hold um, and what, what the implications are of that within the restitution conversation and the, the idea of return. So we won't be able to delve into that question deeply. It is a big question, but um, we will start to discuss that particularly in relation to the question of IP and property. We're joined by Dr. Andrea Wallace, who is a senior lecturer in law, focusing on the intersections of art and cultural heritage within the digital realm. And so one of the things, there's a couple of, of ways that intellectual property is really important to, um, to this process. First is whether or not there's intellectual property in the object that the institution is working with. And so intellectual property can be copyright, it can be um, a patent, it can be trademark, you know, there's different things that kind of fall under the, the umbrella of intellectual property. And most often, especially with uh, heritage collections, we're thinking about copyright, or we're thinking about um, different types of rights like traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions um, that have been created to go alongside intellectual property rights, because intellectual property rights are a very specific understanding of exclusivity. Um, they think about someone owning the rights for other people to copy, you know, to recreate, to do things around the object. Um, and so we have these different kind of moving pieces that we need to think about in relation to the object that's in the institution's collection. And that may actually impact whether or not they can take a photograph of it and what they're able to do with the photograph. 
Because if that object is protected, they have to think about who owns those rights and who should be consulted in that process. Um, a lot of intellectual property rights do expire um, or, you know, traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. We have national laws thinking about how those need to be respected and protected as well. Um, but then if there are no rights that restrict the institution and what the institution can do with the object, or they don't, you know, encounter or, or restrict the institution from making a digital uh, image of the work, then we start to think about what rights might exist in the actual digital photograph. So the institution, because they've made the photograph or the photographer or anyone who's involved in it may have some rights in the actual digital image. And so those are the sorts of things that also become important when we think about what gets published online. Okay, so I'm Notando Mikoko. I'm a copyright um, and licensing specialist in creative sector, mostly working with music. Um, I've worked with visual arts, literary works, etc. I personally have a keen interest in um, IKS and have had the opportunity to make inputs to some of the legal um uh, the legislation um, put through parliament in South Africa around indigenous knowledge systems and traditional knowledge and the relationship with intellectual property. Well, so intellectual property is really a system of property ownership, obviously looking at the intangible types of property. And it comes from a particular philosophy that's very individual centric um, and it balances, essentially, intellectual property balances the individual's rights to the fruits of his or her labor versus the public interest in having mm -hmm. access to the fruits of that labor. And you've got different types of intellectual property, designs, um, patents, trademarks, copyright. I'll speak more on copyright because that is my area um, specifically. But I think, you know, when getting into this, this discussion, one really needs to understand that the, the, the essence and the basis of intellectual property is fundamentally different to the approach and, and the essence of indigenous knowledge. So like I've said, IP, all the different IP um, really is based or, or centers around the individual and the individual's rights to um, owning and having a monopoly, albeit a limited monopoly, on the fruits of their labor. In order for copyright to exist... Um, there, there are a number of elements. Um, there has to be an identifiable creator, like this person is the person who created this thing. Also, there has to be a date of creation. Yeah. Um, it has to be material form, for example, and it has to be original. Now, if we look at indigenous knowledge, there is no identifiable creator really, um, as in a single person or a single entity. It's a people, a community. Date of creation, unknown. Um, and in, 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 in the context of types of creative works like, you know, songs or, or stories, um, it's not necessarily always in material form. So someone would have to put in material form, then copyright will exist in that particular copy. So I think, yeah, as, as, a, as a sort of basic introduction. Okay, so there's so much being said here, but I think that the vital point that's really important to get from this is... Notando kind of describes how the Western 18th century invention of intellectual property that is protected by the World Intellectual Property Organization is kind of quite a fixed system that has very particular rules and that these rules are based on individual time-determined creations and that it's important to understand that that protection as Andrea mentions, has an expiry date. So when we think about the actual original objects in the museums, under the frameworks of intellectual property systems that currently govern us, they are not actually protected um, because of the various reasons that Andrea and Natanda have, have discussed. And so the original objects in museums are not generally under the usual kind of frameworks of intellectual property. They're not protected what does become the question then is the uh, digital replicas, whether they're images or um, 3D scans, those are then new creations of the originals. And so the questions of rights of copy and who owns what and the kind of new creations, those questions emerge as we make copies of the originals. Um, and we'll discuss those questions a little bit more. 
what's really interesting um, about what has come out uh, from Tando and Andrea is this, uh, this concept of intellectual property is essentially a Western concept of property ownership, right? And the whole idea behind IP is centered around the rights of an individual who has created or produced a certain thing. So what happens if uh, material or culture, uh, both in tangible and intangible form, is not necessarily attributed to an individual, as in many African communities, it is attributed to the community and the society at large. So we begin to have this kind of confluence of legal system or legal framework that is not designed for our traditions, our societies and our cultures being copied and pasted over uh, this kind of ideas. And, and Molemo, you and I have talked about it, that this in itself is a very, very big violence. Uh, the ways in which we can reduce everything that our society has created and place it within the framework of an entirely different uh, way of living, an entirely different society, and then be forced to kind of comply with that. And this is this is very interesting in this discussion because then we begin this question of who has the right to digitize. You know, if you don't own the original copy, you don't own the original object, um, do you have a right to digitize it? Do you then also have rights to the digital image that you didn't own in the first place? And can you prevent people from taking photographs or accessing the images when the original object is not yours to begin with, right? I think there's also a fundamental question of like, if intellectual property law covers you, say, for 50 years of original invention and that object is then taken from you <laughs> um, and you don't actually have it in your possession because it was, say, stolen, um, when does the 50 years start? Like, how does that, does, how, how does that work as well? Right? There's a whole lot of questions that emerge. Um, and I think Natando already starts to delve into some of the really fascinating um, work that's being done from around the world around, okay, um, there are a whole lot of systems that don't fit into this existing sort of intellectual property framework. How do we address that? Whereas with Indigenous knowledge, it's very community-centric and communal and more than the individual's interest, the public or the community's interest um, is paramount. And usually this uh, ind Indigenous knowledge or also referred to as traditional knowledge, um, like in the WIPO um, um, environment, is usually tied to the essence of that community, whether it's, you know, the spirituality of that community or the identity. So that's sort of from a broad perspective, the difference between the two systems. Um, and then if you sort of zone into copyright, for example, very similar with the other types of intellectual property. But like I said, I'll kind of talk to copyright. I mean, if I can just talk to that, there are two schools of thought, right? There's the one school of thought that really says we, we must, because the intellectual property system is established, it's recognized, it's respected, and ultimately it runs, it runs the world. I mean, the economies ultimately run on IP, yeah. right? <laughs> So what we need to do is make sure that we take the, our indigenous knowledge and fit it into that system. It has to fit because then it will get the maximum protection. And yeah, and, and, and that, is, that is one school of thought. And I mean, I'll talk about it, but when we speak about um, the South African experience, you know, when I was, when, when we were going through that, and we still are going through it, but there was a time there was a particular piece of legislation that was being debated. And this was, you know, really high on the agenda as to, can you really fit? I remember there was a, there was a, a quote by one of the um, the academics around this saying, "But can you really fit a, a square peg into a round hole?" The IKS being the square peg, the sure, IP system yeah. being the round hole. As opposed to when we think about an image of an object and thinking about that image within the same kind of system, um, if the object that we're thinking about, of course, doesn't come from like the copyright system and the copyright mentality and how things are made, um, then those rights can actually be a bit uh, inappropriate in how they get applied to the digital work. Um, so for example, with all the Benin bronzes, you can go online and you can search and you can find all kinds of images that say copyright trustees of the X museum or copyright this museum. 
And there, just on its face, there's a bit of um, uh, kind of a, a confrontation, you know, that the viewer might look at that and say, wait, hold on. I have to go to this institution for permission to use this, but who does this work actually belong to? And when we start to think about restitution, those are the questions. It's the questions of who the actual object belongs to, who uh, the rights belong to that are associated with those works, who should even be making the decision about how to digitize it, whether to digitize it, whether to claim rights in all of those digital images. Um, but because digitization is such like a thing that's so embedded as something that's normal, um, we, we don't necessarily ask those questions at the point of digitization. And one of the things that, um, that my colleague Matilde Pavis and I have been working on a lot is, is really trying to like say digitization is not neutral. Depending on where something is digitized and the country where it sits, all of the rights of that law, of that country, are going to attach to the digital materials and they're going to prevent people from accessing it. They're going to enable people to commercialize it. It's a whole nother layer and form of knowledge and wealth extraction um, that we really need to be conscious about when we're thinking about restitution and digital restitution. So we know that there is work being done to try and reimagine intellectual property from the perspective of Indigenous knowledge systems um, and that this needs to be something completely different and that there's this real challenge of, as Notando says, putting the square peg in a round hole. But we also know that as museums are digitizing, even in the space of this conversation around trying to address indigenous knowledge systems, museums are going ahead with digitizing and anything that's being digitized fits within the existing law that we know doesn't work. And regardless of a museum's intentions, if you're digitizing, you're creating new things within the law framework of that country. And that law framework is kind of internationally agreed and all powerful and you can't necessarily... Um, sort of apply other systems that aren't within your own legal framework in your European country where you are digitizing? So, you know, I, I kind of get this very deep sense of fear that uh, all this digitization is actually creating a much um, more different form of complexity that will essentially end up um, disenfranchising and not being of benefit to the communities of origin and the source communities where these objects come from. Uh, Molema, you and I have talked about several times uh, in this podcast, but also in different panels around the dangers of this kind of mass digitization. And we're talking about hundreds of thousands of objects. Uh, these are the objects themselves. Now we imagine that each of these object has its own kind of um, copyright complexity, intellectual property complexity, right? And we're digitizing en masse, we're digitizing, you know, quantity, quantity fast. So what does it mean that we're creating this kind of loop loopholes um, in a very massive scale? When it comes to intellectual property, the other thing that has been um, floated or is used uh, to kind of pushback against individual ownership uh, is open access licensing and open access frameworks. Uh, by open access, we are meaning that uh, data is free to access, it's uh, free to use, and it's freely distributed, um, which is also uh, a kind of Western approach to looking at data. What does it mean when objects are taken from the community and then you decide uh, that, okay, now we want to make it free for everyone? when the community themselves have not had uh, part of the decision-making. And so Andrea takes us into what this actually looks like. So, of course, you know, in the past two decades, we've seen cultural institutions um, go from taking digital images of the objects that are in their collections um, and using those internally for, you know, thinking about their cataloging system and how different staff can access and view things that may be in storage to starting to publish that material online um, so that the public can see what are in collections, but also so that the public can reuse some of the stuff that's in collections too. 
And so that's really kind of um, what's happening with the open access movement. There's a lot of important uh, impacts that are coming from and around transparency about what's actually in the institution. Um, but there's also a lot of important questions when we think about what sorts of permissions are placed around uh, the digital you know, photographs and the data and the things that, that institutions publish online, because it can allow the public to do some really amazing and incredible things where we're taking the digital stuff that's made available by one institution and linking it and connecting it with the digital stuff that's made available by another institution. So in that way, we can ask different questions across collections that we're not able to do without that digital material and without having access to it. And I'm a huge open access advocate, but it really does come down to the decision and who makes the decision around that. And so that's another thing that, you know, Matilda and I were trying to point out is that even the, the decision to make something open access or to waive rights should really be made by the people who hold the rights in the objects. Um, and so we were trying to, you know, bring a little bit more light to this very short paragraph or two around kind of this world of open access that that was possible. Um, because, you know, there's even questions about how people digitize and how objects are represented. They're still presented as if they are like specimens. You know, there's a very kind of object focused way of viewing the image through the camera, um, which is another form of capture that also then controls how we read and we view and we see the work that is captured in the actual digital image. And so I think, you know, there are some ways that that can shut down future creativity, some ways that that can make us read a work and, and the knowledge and the information and, and, and the stuff that surrounds it in a very culturally specific way as well. And so we also were trying to point out there are other ways to digitize. There are other ways to reproduce. There are other ways to think about what a copy, quote unquote, is and how that copy can carry knowledge and information out into the world. And those sorts of things should be done by the people who are associated with, with the objects, too. Um, so I think there are, you know, there's some moving pieces and there are some, you know, different things. It's, it's, it's more about like being able to hold all of these things in our mind at once so that we can kind of see the impact that this like rush to digitization and making everything available open access kind of shuts out. So it is about the decisions, it's about the ownership, but it's also about the potential of open access and what it could be if we push back against all of the habits and the things you know that, that have, have directed it of late, which of course are related to resources and who has possession of the works. And then we start to walk back from that because those seems like obvious examples, but there could be objects that have uh, a spirithood, a personhood, a ceremonial purpose that also shouldn't be digitized. And when you think about the, the people who possess the works and whether they're the best people to be making those decisions because they don't have that insight or that knowledge, we then start to think about the different questions that arise around that recommendation to digitize everything before we send it back. Um, but even with respect to making stuff available open access and even making all of those digital images available in the public domain for anyone to reuse for whatever purpose, you know, there's a few different issues that come from there. And one is that, you know, for years, the institutions in possession have been able to commercialize the works and make money from them. So by putting copies of images out into the public domain where no one has to pay for them anymore and no one has to reuse them, it's essentially removing that revenue source from the institutions um, that could potentially do that going forward once the objects are returned to them. And um, that is a question, you know, I think that's really complex and I'm a huge open access advocate, but it really does come down to the decision and who makes the decision around that. So Andrea is saying so much here that is really, really vital around museums' choices to go open access as a very positive approach to recognizing their role as a public good. But of course, there's still questions here. And a really good example of this is the project called The Other Nefertiti, which uh, was a really interesting art project, um, a release of a 3D scan of a bust of Nefertiti, which is based in the Neues Museum in Berlin, Germany, um, by artists Nura Albaidri and a colleague of hers whose name now 
escapes me, sorry. And this 3D scan was released and it caused quite a bit of controversy um, at the time. But the really interesting process that, that then, for, for our context, that emerges afterwards is um, the museum is pressured by another artist to then release their version of the Nefertiti, their 3D scan. And through legal systems, they are forced to then release their 3D scan. And when the museum releases their 3D scan, they have digitally engraved a Creative Commons license into their 3D scan. And so they release this 3D scan with this license, and this raises a lot of questions. The first question, of course, is that they didn't release the 3D scan to begin with, um, and they were forced to release the scan. And so this Creative Commons license is only being put out because they've been forced to put this out, right? Which tells you that the initial intention around the scan was certainly not open access. The second thing that's really complex about this engraved license is the fact that there's actually, um, it's, it's not fully clear because 3D scans and what they mean in intellectual property are still a new space. But in principle, this object is not under copyright because it's so old. And the 3D scan of it is actually an exact replica. And an exact replica is not a new work and therefore doesn't necessarily have new copyrights on it. And so in principle, the museum doesn't actually have the right to make a claim of a new work on that 3D scan and therefore doesn't have the right to put a Creative Commons license on it. I hope you're still with me. The third thing that's, of course, really interesting about this, which Andrea points to, is a kind of public knowledge of a formal claim on this Nefertiti by Egypt to get it back. Um, and so, in principle, it's under a kind of restitution cloud. And so, this 3D scan and this license on this 3D scan is also a claim of a kind of right to determine the use of this 3D scan by a museum whose rights to that object are currently under question, right? And as Andrea says, when this object is returned, the rights to how it is used have already been predetermined in the process of engraving this license under it uh, by the people who don't own it. And therefore, the Egyptians would have to go through um, a much more complex process to redefine how this should be used. And I think that this is a really interesting example of also the ways in which museums can weaponize the idea of open access as a strategy that undermines some of the questions of ownership and restitution that exist within the museum world and this relationship between African restitution claims and museum practice. The Nefertiti discussion, um, essentially, and all the kind of dynamics that went into, into the reproduction of the Nefertiti bust around ownership, around what happens when we return things, and essentially around, you know, the frameworks that are being set by museums um, when there is a kind of restitution contention on the table. Uh, and we know that museums are under a lot, a lot of pressure to digitize objects, artifacts, archives. Uh, I work with museums, training museums to digitize their artifacts. And one of the most common things that people say is that we fear we're getting left behind. So trust me, museum digitization pressure is very real. But at the same time, there's also very little consideration going on on the ethics of digitization, the ownership of, of digital reproduction, the rights of communities, who, who gets to say whether an object should be digitized or not. And we are essentially creating more complexities, as we had said in the beginning, um, than we are solving. And so the question for us at this point is what are the practical steps? What do we need to do to to fix this? And what can we, how can we mitigate the kind of damage that is already happening at a very, very rapid rate? So sui generis is, it says unique and specific to itself. Like it, it's its own genre of law, if you want to put it like that. So it's sui generis. And that one says that we can't fit IKS or indigenous knowledge or traditional knowledge protection into any existing um, legal framework uh, into the IP framework, we have to create an entirely unique framework. And I think that's really the, the school of thought that's at the forefront 
And I think I, I subscribe to that as well for one main reason. Okay. And it goes back to the difference in the two systems, right? Is that intellectual property is ultimately there to create this limited monopoly for the individual, right? It's, it's there to, to capitalize on a particular creation. Whereas I believe that the system that IKS needs, the first, the primary, yes, we, it obviously has to have beneficiation um, ability for the communities to benefit, but ultimately the main concern is to preserve and protect for the benefit of the collective. Mm -hmm. That's a different spirit. The, this, the laws have, or the systems are, have different spirits. There have been examples where, for example, the Smithsonian has worked with communities to make sure that the reproduction process really does honor the work and uh, the community ideals, and then the original is given back to the community while the reproduction is held by the museum. And that's happened in a few different instances. And so I think there's like a range of things that can, can kind of happen around here. But one of the things we really need to prepare ourselves for, and I think that is fair around digital restitution, is the host institution completely withdrawing any sort of claim or ownership or possession of physical and digital materials. And that should relate to the archival materials, the associated materials, all of these things that have been generated in the course of possession that relate to the object, that relate to the collection. Um, because, you know, if the, if the community of origin says we want everything back and we would like for you to you know, withdraw any claim, ownership, all the material, that is entirely appropriate. You know, and so I think often some institutions start to think, oh, God, oh, no, we won't be able to study. We won't be able to do these things. And those are really important feelings that people who are having them for the first time should kind of slow down and think about and let resonate in terms of um, who should <laughs> who should be feeling those with respect to the, to, the, to the collections themselves. I don't know how else to say this, but uh, yeah, I think it's totally appropriate that, that we, we include absolute withdrawal of all materials, digital and physical, that can be in an institution um, as a potential outcome for digital restitution. But we have to start thinking about things outside of this kind of binary copyright and public domain system. You know, we need to start thinking about ways to uh, even limit digital access to the people for whom it's most appropriate or thinking about um, different forms of labels and licenses to communicate the appropriateness of the reuse on the front end. So there's um, been work in uh, by Kim Christian and uh, Jane Anderson around, you know, local contexts. And um, there's another uh, project that's called Enrich that's looking about data sovereignty. But these are asking these really important questions around how do we enable reuse according to the complexity of the material itself, rather than this idea of ownership and exclusivity and um, being able to commercialize. Because so often, you know, that's that's not the goal of, of trying to make these things available. It's more about how do we educate, how do we contextualize, how do we protect um, the person rather than the rights holder? And um, it's a really important question when we're thinking about, you know, the, the potential of computational processing and the digital divide. Because right now, all of that power is, um, is also held in places that have benefited from uh, wealth transfer, from colonization. And so those sorts of technologies and the availability of them are shaping that area as well and how we think about what's possible, you know, with computers and technology. Um, I mean, you know, that's not an absolute statement by any means, but there's a lot of commercial uh, val or I wouldn't say value, but commercial um, desires that are being embedded in that, that, um, yeah, we should, we should really kind of slow down and be hesitant to, to, to allow. Um, yeah. There is also a vital point um, coming out of what uh, Andrea is discussing here around these really interesting processes of working with communities to ensure that their um, interests and wishes are respected in digitization processes. But there's also an additional question about, okay, but what is the value to these communities? What are these communities really getting from this process? And value is an important question in the intellectual property conversation around restitution, particularly of digital copies, partly because coming back to our Gianefertiti story at the Neues Museum, 
Uh, to this day, the Neues Museum sells replicas, physical replicas. But these physical replicas are made from that exact same 3D scan. And they're sold for thousands and thousands of euros. We'll include the link in the notes to this um, podcast. And, and that really points to the kinds of value that are emerging out of these objects and the kinds of value that come also from their copies. And this is a discussion that we don't really have in the restitution space very much because we like to think of restitution being an issue of like public good. But people are making money from this and people have made money from this for a very long time. And there is, of course, this really important question about the fact that Africa has been robbed of its value and what is the potential of a return of value when these objects are returned. Mm -hmm. And it's it's very telling also in the ways in which we ascribe the value, as you're saying, because we have a cultural value, spiritual value, when it comes to, from an African perspective, those are the kind of things that we are seen to, to care more about. But what we're not really talking about is the violence around the economic value that Western museums are making from creating high resolution digital reproductions and selling them as souvenirs online, ETC. And what we, we are hearing from African practitioners is that the whole digitization process is really an engagement with the object and with the people. And when you begin to ask these questions with communities, then you can be able to establish ethical uh, ways of creating this value, especially financial and economic value, and bringing in new audiences into this space to think about using this digital reproductions, using the digitized objects in ways that respond both to, you know, social value, spiritual value, etc. So Sam and Mulenga from the Women's History Museum have spoken to us at length about working with communities. What's interesting about their approach is that they're also using digitization as a as a way to pivot and engage young artists, um, young audiences with the digitized data, uh, inviting these audiences and artists to create essentially new derivatives of the digital work inspired by the digital data. And by digital data, I'm talking about digitized historical collections. Uh, so we hear about this briefly now from Mulenga. Okay. Okay. So my name is Mulenga. That's that's really, I mean, like, you know, the, the, the whole thing of ownership is really a very interesting space. Um, there's two issues. There's the, you know, when you're when you're when you, when you when you create something from something else, say it's a song, and then you you do a your own version. You own the you own the rights to that new version. Yeah. So we're kind of exploring along those lines for the individual users. If you create something new from an object, it, that new idea is your idea, so you mm. can copyright it. Secondly, if you create that new idea because you have been paid, say, mm -hmm. by the Women's History Museum, mm -hmm. that's a commissioned, it's a commissioned um, activity. So then we can have a discussion around who owns what there and uses and all that kind of stuff. So that's a different, um, that's a different layer as well that we, are, we understand we have to, you know, explore. But we're certainly exploring it along the same lines as any any kind of copyright when you when you produce an original a, a new thing from an old old version if you want. Um, so that you know, there's there, there are those two layers of things that we are that we're exploring right now, and we're having conversations around that, and it's very very interesting. <laughs> it's very interesting. We don't know where it will land, but I think it's 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 necessary to have a conversation. And one thing I didn't even mention is is also copyright as a as a selector and something that carries its own bias because you know when digitization and even mass digitization really started to take off people were thinking oh we can really make money off of our collection and so just that desire embedded a commercial value a viability selection process into the decision of what to digitize and what not to digitize which recanonizes a lot of stuff because that's the stuff that's going to generate money. Um, so there's, and then when we think about open access, a lot of times people are like, okay, well, let's take the collections that we do have and make those available online. So then when we think about what has been digitized um, and what's popular and you know what has made it into digital form, copyright is something that made 
a big impact on what we have in digital form in order to be released. And now that there's no copyright and what's released, people can do whatever they want with it, which then creates these algorithms and these, you know, these bigger things that think that those are the things of value. No, and I, I think that um, that's probably will be the case in many instances, you know, because now that, you know, restitution is, and hopefully the, the full um, legal frameworks at an international level and at national level will will really, you know, come to pass, whether it's um, sui generis or they manage to put it in the IP system, we, it'll, we'll have to look back because there's been a lot of benefiting that's been happening to the exclusion of the communities. And then what needs to happen is full disclosure of what commercial financial benefits, you know, have happened or, you know, how people have, how the different, the new, the acquirers benefited and then there has to be a benefit sharing agreement because if I if if we look at for example in the South African context um, and it's not even only only the South African context when when there's a derivative work created so if there's a new I think there was that example that that you gave in the, in an email around the Louis Vuitton blankets and I, there's a that's also a very layered question uh, which we must also touch on but in a, in that situation if we were to assume that the Sienna Morena blankets fully belong to the Basutu people, right? What needs to happen is that there are four elements. So, the, so then the, the, the Louis Vuitton blankets would be derivative works. And before you can create a derivative work, you need to, there are four main things. You need full and proper prior informed consent. So, and that from the community, right? And that means... It's obtained free from any manipulation, interference, and coercion. This is the point that Mulima were talking about earlier, that, you know, these things are bought, but, like, are they really, is it free trade? No. Number two, there has to be full disclosure of the indigenous cultural expressions, artifacts, or knowledge to be used. Number three, there has to be a benefit-sharing agreement. So, that basically, you're licensing. And, and that's where the commonalities with the IP system come in, that, no, you are licensing this use. So there has to be a benefit sharing agreement, and then fourthly, um, there has to be community participation. So adherence to any protocols that the community have developed with regards to the commercialization or, or, or use of their work. So this is this is definitely forward looking. But if you take this as a framework, when we look at restitution and saying, okay, we're now taking these the Benin bronzes back or, or anything, any other artifact, between this moment where they're coming back home and the last. 500 years or 200 years, however, whatever the, the time period is, what are the benefits that have accrued to the entities that we're getting these things back from? And then there has to be a payment. There has to be commercial value that is then shared with the original community over and above bringing, bringing that back. If we follow the, 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 the IK, IK legal frameworks, that's what would happen. I must say, um, hearing Notando speak this way about the potentials of Indigenous knowledge system legal frameworks and the ways in which they protect communities of origin makes what feels like a disaster feel a lot more possible and a lot mm. more doable. And even sort of listening to Andrea, you know, these legal minds, there are systems and frameworks that there are solutions. We, we could be doing this better, I think. And maybe just to give a quick caveat that uh, Notando um, was re responding to the Siena Marina blankets, which are blankets from Lesotho, and you might know them. They were used in, in the Black Panther films. They were the kind of force field mm. shields. Um, and the reason we discussed those blankets was in response to this question of the ways in which African cultures continue to be thefted, mm. thieved, <laughs> um, even, even beyond the, the objects mm. that are in museums. Mm. Um, and, and she did actually mention that the Siena Marina blankets have a much more complex history that isn't um, kind of cut and dry indigenous knowledge mm -hmm. systems um, from Lesotho. And, 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 and it was an interesting example because it reflects on the sense that so much has been taken from the continent, but also that so much of the continent's cultural production mm -hmm. uh, now lives in this kind of strange, multifaceted space between the continent and what we share with so much of the rest of the world. And, uh, I mean, Chow, you would know this. Every couple of years, there's a kind of 
furor about another stolen thing from the continent, whether it's <laughs> injera from Ethiopia yeah. or the Mbira from Zimbabwe, all these kind yeah. of things that are being copyrighted in other parts of the world. And yeah, there is a very, Exactly. And Disney, there's a very specific um, reason that there's, there's this kind of um, paranoia around things being taken yeah. from us. And a exactly. very clear recognition of, of of what we lose when that happens and what communities of origins lose when that happens. Mm-hmm. And um, Notana's response, I think, is so refreshing in relation to that. Black Twitter, African Twitter has done a lot to protect um, kind of the cultural uh, expressions, especially in, in light of Louis Vuitton blankets, kikois, kiondos, uh, and things that the public is very sensitive and attuned to the kind of dangers in which um, our cultures and our traditional expressions are are being appropriated, but also are financially viable in, in different countries with no benefit whatsoever to the countries and the people and the communities that they're from. As opposed to actually ending this episode on a very like low and bleak note, We've been talking about digital destitution and what it means, you know, what, what are people doing? What are they saying? How do they perceive it? But one of the things that we wanted to talk about as we end this episode is to really push back um, very categorically and very clearly against the notion that digital restitution is a replacement for physical restitution in itself. Um, it's interesting that people even begin to think that you could just give back a digital copy of an object or an artifact and um, the communities should be pleased with it. There's a Pokomo, Pokomo is a, a community here in Kenya towards the coast, and there's a drum that was taken from them um, in the early 1900s. Now, this drum was very sacred to the community itself. And I was watching a documentary on this drum, which is currently in the basement of the British Museum. It's called the Gaji Drum. And someone actually commented, um, I don't understand why they cannot record the drum being played and like WhatsApp it back to the community. So, I mean, it it really is is interesting. Can you imagine this like spiritual object that is so central to a community's life and someone's like, just play the drum in the British Museum basement, record it on WhatsApp and just like send the sound back, you know? And so we're talking about this in jest but this is a perspective that people actually stick to and it's it's very dangerous and and patronizing in a sense that we are seeing digital restitution as a replacement but not as facilitating physical restitution in itself absolutely and i think that you know africans have have very viscerally and like ethically responded against the idea that digital restitution replaces Mm. physical restitution. Mm -hmm. But in having this conversation with these incredible minds like Andrea and Otando, it becomes so clear that the whole precept of the one replacing the other is legally illogical, right? That that the Mm -hmm. idea that a European would make a WhatsApp recording, which then belongs to the European because they made it, (laughs) right? And then the can be returned sense. back to us. It's just <laughs> like, it's um, clearly unfathomable. Honestly. Impossible to think that uh, instead of getting, instead of Africans getting back what they made, yeah. Europeans will make something new out of what they took mm-hmm. and return that back to Africans. As, uh, as, an, as a gift or as a sign of benevolence in itself. Um, and so what is the intention of all this digital work that we're doing and we pose this to you as listeners, as museum practitioners, um, what is the intention of the digital work and digitization and accessing this data when we still have all these underlying issues, you know, and what are the ethics behind it, essentially? Big question. Can you imagine, like, what's up in this (laughs) man who's, like, in his 90s and saying, you remember the drum that was stolen from you when you were a kid? Here's the sound. This is what you get back. Because this is what you need. Oh, Something, pl- some tinny sound coming out of your phone. <laughs> That's been compressed because, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's not even the highest. And it's more important that it's in my basement. 
Exactly. Much more important than it's in my basement. And I see it. I even need it in my basement. And I see it, even though I don't know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Goodness gracious. This podcast is brought to you by Open Restitution Africa, a collaboration between African Digital Heritage and Andani Africa. The podcast is produced by Chao Tayana Maina and Mulemo Mwilwa, with Pumzile Nombo Sotwala and Letabolaka Gumede on research. Thank you to Josh Chiundiza for the music, Karugu Maina on design, and Annalene van Heimbeek on editing. The podcast was made possible by 99 Questions at the Stifton Humboldt Forum in Berliner Schloss. This podcast is also available in zine form in French and German at www.openrestitution.africa and www.humboldtforum.org. Thank you for joining us.